Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. I am back from CES and recovering from whatever CES illness I picked up while I was out in Las Vegas. It's funny, I've been going for I think the last five years and this is the first time I actually got sick from CES. I did get sick at NAB one year, uh, but this is the first CES illness that I picked up. And today's wrap up is all going to be about the show. We're gonna look at uh, what was in my bag, some tips for covering the show, some challenges that I encountered there that I'm sure you might as well if you decided to cover it for your own channel. And we'll also look at some plans for next year uh, because things are changing in the industry and there's not as much new stuff as there used to be. So I have to be a little smarter uh, for future shows. So let's get to it. Now, before we begin, I want to thank some new supporters we had on the channel while I was gone. El Taco Destroyer and Hand Color. So I want to thank those two for signing up via the YouTube membership program. Your support is appreciated there. Uh, we also had a couple of new super chatters from my live stream I did last night. Uh, they are Cedar Lake and Chris Griffin. So I want to thank everyone who contributed to the channel this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, along with those of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. So let's take a look at the week in review. I was hoping to do a live stream from CES, but unfortunately the bandwidth didn't work out. Uh, but I did do one when I got back, because as you know, I've been doing streaming for Amazon and they had me on the front page of Amazon last night at 11 p.m. Eastern time. So we had a late night shift here uh, where I looked at some of the value packed products from the past year. And it was a fun one. A lot of you joined in as well. So that was a fun little experiment. And then of course on the main channel, we had nothing but CES. We have the three dispatches that I did along with two sponsored videos I did for ARM. Uh, who sponsored our CES coverage. And both of these are pretty interesting, actually. Uh, so you'll definitely want to check out those sponsored posts of the OrCam My i2, which is designed for the visually impaired, and the Life Plus Life Leaf, which is in the process of going through uh, FDA certification. Uh, but it's a smartwatch that will be able to measure uh, blood glucose levels on an ongoing basis with no uh, finger pricks or test strips or anything else like that. So pretty cool stuff. Check it out in the master playlist down below. All right, so let's take a look back now at CES 2020. I have to say this was probably one of the more challenging shows to cover, not logistically, but because there wasn't a lot of new stuff. In fact, I was surprised by how little there was, at least for things that I cover on this channel. Uh, there was just not a lot to talk about and a lot of the same stuff. I mean, how many smart light bulbs or smart plugs can we cover? It's just, you know, there's not a lot of new innovative things and that made the coverage a little bit difficult. Uh, as far as what the best of the show was, um, honestly, I think the coolest thing that I saw was that new telescope from Celestron. It wasn't anything uh, spectacular from a gee whiz standpoint. It's a pretty simple device, but it does make finding things in the night sky easier. Uh, we covered that on our first dispatch. The price point, I think, is pretty reasonable for what they deliver. Uh, and I'm really eager to buy one, actually, to use with my daughter out in the backyard because we were planning on getting a telescope. And this one uh, is the type of telescope we were looking at, a Newtonian. And it's also, again, got the star tracking with the smartphone integration that I was uh, looking for in a telescope. So I'm really eager to see what that one's going to be all about. But really, that was like the thing that I remember and think about the most from the show. Uh, the rest of the stuff was pretty cool, but there wasn't a lot of new and innovative things that got me really excited for the next couple of months. It was really more of the same with just some iterations on prior versions of what we've already seen. And to some extent, I think we're at a maturation point with our current level of technology. Uh, mobile phones have advanced very quickly, but I think they've matured very quickly now as well. Uh, so we'll have to see just what comes out next that might get us all excited again. Uh, but for the most part, it was a show that was really lacking in a lot of new announcements of things that are actually not concepts, but real products that you could buy. And we'll touch on a little bit more on that when we look at the Sony booth in a little bit. Uh, now, there was two companies, though, that had the most new products at the show, at least of the things that we looked at. Uh, Lenovo, who we covered on the third dispatch, who, by the way, is an occasional sponsor here on the channel, had a ton of stuff to announce, including that foldable laptop. Uh, so you can check that all out in Dispatch 3. And then Arcade 1UP had a ton of stuff announced at the show as well. 
Uh, so there was some things to be excited to see, but again, this was the exception. Usually we see this many announcements from many companies, at least of the ones that we typically cover. So again, it was a pretty uh, low key show, I think, for new product announcements. Now, a few of you were curious as to what was in the big backpack that I was wearing at the show, this one right here. And some of you were upset that I didn't take it off before I took the camera out to start recording. And the reason is, is that we were moving so quickly and some of these events were so crowded that it didn't make sense to take the bag off. That's why I didn't do it. I never take it off. I get my shot and I move on to the next thing because there's a million people behind me trying to get in there and try to see what, uh, what I'm looking at or what they want to see. Um, now, I wanted to show you what we put in here because a bulk of what we take to the show with us fits in the bag. I do have a second bag that I bring that has chargers and wires and that sort of stuff, but uh, for covering the show, I can get everything I need into a single backpack here. It's all about efficiency, as you all know with me, and that is something that I try to maintain as I go out on the road as well. Uh, in the pockets over here, I just have some of my business cards and some of the cards that I get from the people that I meet. Uh, to be honest, you know, why I go to CES is, is, of course, first of all, to bring you some coverage of it, but there's a benefit for me from a networking perspective because it's good to be seen, and therefore having business cards and collecting cards is a key mission of the event to uh, get more ideas of products that we can bring in to review. Now, the camera we use is one that I bought for my first CES many years ago, uh, and that is this Sony camera. This is a Sony... Uh, PXWX70. I think I paid about $1,700 for this uh, way back in 2014, right at the end of the year. And the reason why I went with this camera was for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it's got a nice big sensor on it. It's got a one inch uh, sensor. And when I first got the camera, it was only 1080p, but they later upgraded it via firmware to 4K. And based on the time that I bought the camera, uh, that 4K upgrade, I think, was only like 50 bucks. So it was a pretty inexpensive way to get a lot more functionality added to the camera. And they've since added additional uh, features to it through firmware updates. So in addition to going from 1080p to 4K, uh, the initial upgrade was only a 60 megabit per second 4K shooting mode. And it didn't do uh, facial recognition for exposure and focus in that 4K mode initially. Then they pushed out a second firmware update that upped the recording uh, bandwidth to 100 megabits per second and added the facial recognition, which was great. And because it's got a great big sensor on it, it can do some really good stabilization. So I think it has optical stabilization built in, but it also does some digital stabilizing as well. And as a result, uh, we get a very smooth shot for the most part when we're out in the field. Uh, now the camera has two parts to it. You just saw me attaching the upper arm here uh, because on this arm, uh, we have uh, XLR microphone inputs here. And the mics that I use are somewhere in the bag here, I hope. I may have taken them. Oh, here it is. Uh, the mic that I use here is a Sennheiser. Uh, this is their AVX system. This is the exact mic that I was using. And many of you were commenting just how relatively clean the audio sounded, even though we were in very noisy rooms. And that's thanks to the mic head that I got for it. This is an 835, uh, and this is what they call a super cardioid head. Uh, which means that if you talk into the top of it, it generally filters out all of the other audio that might be in the room. It's really a great way to isolate yourself in super noisy environments. And that's why we use a stick mic here. Um, the AVX system has a couple of pieces to it. And I've got um, one of the receivers here in the bag. I actually use this in the studio as well. So the other receiver is on my other camera. And you've got this little receiver here. You just attach it to the front of the camera. And I think these operate over, if I'm not mistaken, like 700 megahertz. So it's a, a, a frequency band that's not used by a lot of other equipment. And I have never had this fail on me ever. Uh, there's no frequency to set. You just turn it on, you pair it up, and you're done. And it is just absolutely rock solid, stable, and reliable. And you don't have to worry about it. And that's why I like the Sennheiser stuff. I have some lavaliers for it as well. So when you see our Plex interview, uh, same uh, receivers here just uh, hooked up with the, uh, the little body pack uh, transmitters that I'm wearing right now, and that's it. It's just completely seamless and a really reliable system that I have never had fail on me. Uh, so it's a little on the expensive side. I think the kit with the stick mic and a lavalier and a receiver is about $1,200, but 
you get what you pay for, right? If you want something to work and not really cause any aggravation, especially in CES where there's a lot of interference, you get this and it works. So that's that. Um, I put a piece of plastic in here just to keep this, um, mic, uh, uh, this mic holder here from rattling around. You really can't take it off, unfortunately. Um, and that's it. It's a pretty compact camera here. Uh, excellent video quality out of it. And what I do is I record on two cards at the same time. Uh, so there are two card slots on here. And the reason why I do that is in case one of the cards fails. So basically, it's, when it's recording, it's writing to both cards simultaneously. And then I've got you know, a fallback should something happen. So the best way to look at this is like having a little mini raid uh, on the camera itself. So that's how I record. Uh, we shot everything this year at 1080p 30. Even though I could do 4K, um, what we were doing was sending our footage back to Jake here in Connecticut to edit. Uh, so having um, a 4K file to send back, even when we send back our compressed proxy footage, was going to be a heavy lift. So we kept everything simple at 1080p this year for recording. But in future years, if we have uh, better bandwidth or have somebody on site who can help edit, we would probably do a 4K production to make it a little bit easier. And I had an on-camera light here. Let me switch back. Uh, this one I got at a B&H sale a while ago. This is a Draycast. I don't know what the part number is on this one. I'll have to, uh, oh, here it is, uh, DR Cam L Pro B. And it's a super bright light. It comes with two batteries here. And it works really well for what we need it for. It's a little heavy and bulky, but it's a good on-camera light that is, again, simple to use. It's got adjustable color temperature here at the top, or the back, and you can also adjust the intensity of it. And then what we do is we mount it to the shoe mount on the top of the camera uh, with this little guy here, and that is the light that we're using. Uh, let's see what else we've got in the bag here. I have, right over here, a backup camera in case something goes wrong. Uh, now this camera, the other camera I paid for, this one I got in free of charge recently from the Amazon Vine program. Uh, this is a new uh, camcorder from Canon called the XA45. Uh, this is like their introductory prosumer slash commercial camera. Uh, it is, I think about, 1700 bucks right now, 4K, uh, 30 frames per second max. And it's got great battery life, very compact. The, the video quality isn't as good as my Sony, in my opinion, just because the sensor's not as big. Uh, it's a marginal difference. Uh, it also has the XLR inputs, though, so you have that going for you there. And it's certainly a lot more compact. Also has great stabilization and a uh, really nice little backup camera. Partly why I didn't use this one is that the Sony's been working so well, and I don't want to mess things up that I know are working. Uh, but if something happened to the Sony, we could easily uh, just plug those Sennheiser mics into this one and be off and running. So I'm really uh, happy with what um, Canon has put together here. The Canon cameras also do better with autofocus, by the way. So that's something to keep in mind if you are uh, relying on having things work in auto mode like we are. Uh, the Sony cameras tend to be a little slower on the autofocus. The Canons are quicker. Now, I also have, in addition to a backup camera, a backup microphone. Uh, this is the Shure SM58. It's kind of a legendary microphone. If you go and look at a lot of concert footage, you'll see this mic in use quite a bit. It's another cardioid microphone. It does really, really well in noisy environments. In fact, I was using this before the AVX came out. And it's something that I know will work should something happen to the AVX system or if I forgot a part or something like that. There's a lot of stuff that I have to remember to bring with me. So you can imagine uh, I just bring as much as I can fit in the bag here for redundancy's sake. Um, the microphone, though, of course, is not wireless. So I've got an XLR cable that I take with me. Uh, this, of course, would just plug directly into the cameras to uh, get the mic working. And should something else happen and I lose the ability to use a camera with an XLR connection, I've got an adapter here to plug it into a standard little uh, mic connector you might see on uh, most consumer camcorders. What I used to use as a spare camera was a Sony camera uh, that did not have an XLR input. So this adapter was certainly a lot more important back then. And also in the bag, of course, are my memory cards. I put them in this Pelican case that I bought a while back. I love this case. It is super sturdy, waterproof, all that good stuff. And it's pretty nice to have this layout because I can put uh, cards that I know are safe on one side and then have the other one be the cards that I've already used. Uh, what I was doing, of course, was shooting on two cards for each shoot, um, but also making sure that I had an, an older card paired with a newer card. So I bought 
uh, three new cards before I went off to the show. One of them is missing at the moment. I think it's plugged into my computer upstairs. Uh, and I would pair one of the new cards up with the old one inside the camera because the new card hadn't been used before. I've had a card fail from the factory on me before, so I was really nervous about that. So I have a card that's older, but I know works on one slot and then a brand new one in the other slot. And the good news is everything worked on the trip, so that was helpful. And what I would do at the end of the day is bring the, uh, the cards home, of course, and use this card reader uh, to read the cards on my Mac. And then what I would do is actually uh, leave the card that we shot with in the hotel room so it was not going to be with me because if somebody stole the bag I'd lose all the footage right so uh, we used a new set of cards every day so we weren't overwriting anything I like to have as many copies of footage as possible um, and then I would give Sarah a, a, one of the cards from the day before so she'd have one on her just in case something happened to me you know what I mean I just want to make sure everything is safe and secure uh, now the card reader that I am using uh, is from SanDisk this is their Pro UHS2 reader USB-C reader, it works great with my Mac. It's just for the regular size SD card, but you can of course use one of the adapters if you need to. Uh, and the reason why I got this is that we're starting to see more of these UHS-2 cards coming out. Uh, this is one right here, and they have an extra set of pins for UHS-2 compatible devices, but they're backwards compatible with older devices. So this new card from Sony here I could put in my old camera and it'll still work just fine. It just won't write as fast as it could, uh, given that it's only a UHS-1 device. And as you can see here, my other cards that I use in the camera typically are just the standard UHS-1. What's cool though, is that if you are using a UHS-2 card, you can read your data off the card faster. So you can get the advantage of the speed if you've got a UHS-2 reader. I did a whole video on this. You may want to check it out. Um, but that's the cards that I was using and the strategy behind that. Uh, what else we got in here? Oh, this is uh, my little portable tripod thing from Manfrotto that I bought. Uh, I bought this right before the IFA trip. It's got a neat little button here that you can push to ad adjust things if you need to. And it was interesting, both Sarah and Jake, because Jake went with me to IFA and Sarah went with me to Vegas, uh, they both liked having this on the bottom of the camera to add some stability as they were holding it. So this was a pretty handy handle uh, on top of being something that we could use to set the camera down when we were um, sitting in, in a cafeteria or coffee shop or whatever and didn't want to lay the camera down flat. You can just put this thing down here and it's a nice little uh, tripod that you could set up there. So that was a pretty handy little device there. It's pretty sturdy too. It wasn't all that expensive. I don't recall the price off the top of my head, but it was pretty reasonable. Uh, now this is something I ended up not using just because the bandwidth was so bad. Uh, but this is my little live streaming audio kit for the phone. So you can't just plug in those Sennheiser microphones directly to a phone with this cable um, because you do have to get an adapter for uh, changing the signal a little bit. So let me show you what's in here. And of course on the iPhone you don't have a headphone jack. Uh, so the first thing is this Belkin adapter. Um, this adapter, as you can see, has a lightning connector on it for charging, and then it's got a standard headphone jack on the other side, and it also supports microphone in. And then I had to get uh, this adapter. It's probably actually incorrect to say I'm changing the signal. What it's doing here is just putting the pins in the right place. Um, so this adapter here will take this uh, two-prong microphone output from that uh, XLR adapter and turn it into the three-pronger that the uh, phone is expecting. So if you want to use one of your mics with your phone, you've got to run it through this adapter first, and then I would plug it into here and then connect it up. And then I've got a couple of little mounting brackets here for the receiver, and I've got a little, I, didn't br I forgot to bring it with me actually, so it was good we didn't try to do a live stream, uh, but I've got a little bracket with a couple of tripod mounts on it so you can mount the receiver to the side of the phone, and then the tripod, uh, thing here, the Manfrotto, would be what we use to hold the phone and do the live stream. So if I start doing some more remote live streams, uh, this is the little kit that we'll be using for that, and I keep it all in this little pouch there. Um, got my backup battery here. This is an Anchor 20-something thousand milliamp hour battery. It can output uh, two amps at five volts out of each of these USB ports here. Really useful for charging up my Sennheiser microphone batteries. Uh, the receiver batteries have lasted us all day, but they are the weakest link in the mix. Uh, so those Sennheiser receivers can only go for about three hours of continuous use, uh, but they're tied to the phantom power. So when I turn the camera off, 
uh, the receiver shuts down. So we've never had a battery die on us, but if I was really going for a long time and didn't have a charge in between, I could throw the, uh, the battery uh, into the battery here and give it a good charge. And the Sennheiser batteries all charge themselves. You just plug the battery directly in. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I don't see much else. You pick up a lot of these uh, memory sticks from uh, the, the people exhibiting little press kits on those. And that is, I think, pretty much all we were walking around with. There's a lot to, to remember to pack. And I've been doing this now for so long, I just know what needs to go in the bag. Um, but I'm always nervous about forgetting something. And when I'm about to leave the house for the airport, I'm usually opening the trunk and going back into the bag just to make sure everything is there. Because if you forget one thing, you can't do anything at all. So uh, there's always a little bit of anxiety before I leave to make sure everything is all put together there. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Now, in this bag also is my laptop. It really fits everything. I'm not crazy about this bag because it just doesn't organize very well with the wires here on the pouch at the top. But I have yet to find something better. This is from Tamrack. My wife got this for me a number of years ago. And it's actually held up pretty well. I, you know, I'm usually lugging around probably you know, 30 pounds or more of weight with this when everything is in the bag. Um, and it hasn't fallen apart on me yet. It seems like it's in pretty good shape. And it's been with me to just about every event that I've covered over the last six years. Um, but I am definitely looking for something that offers a little bit more flexibility. And I might just end up moving on to some like rollable Pelican case or something. But in the meantime, uh, the backpack here is working. So if you're wondering what was in the bag, now you know. Now, if you're curious about how we edit the video, I'm using Final Cut Pro, of course. And what I'm doing is using its proxy feature to have Jake edit those videos remotely. And I have a video about how to use Final Cut's proxy feature, which I'll link down below in the master playlist if you're curious. It works really well when you've got uh, upstream bandwidth, which was very challenging during this trip. Uh, so I wanted to talk also about the coverage strategy that I try to employ at the show. Uh, because you have to be realistic. First of all, I know that I'm not CNET, The Verge, or any one of these other big institutions with a staff of a dozen or more who can go out and find all this stuff. It's just me and usually one other person. Uh, so you have to really limit yourself and try to figure out how you're going to make it work given the size and scale of the show and how much little labor force you have to do it. Uh, so what I have done over the years is looked at finding the hidden gems uh, covering the startups and other th companies that are not getting a lot of coverage from the mainstream media, uh, looking at low-cost, high-value products that are something that you can actually get in the near future as opposed to all this uh, conceptual stuff which tends to dominate the media when this show comes around every year. Uh, and I also will cover major brands if we're invited to a private showing or something where we can get a little bit more hands-on time. And let me show you a reason why we don't go chasing around the big brands because of how many people are at this show. So for example, we did stop by the Sony booth when we were walking by to see the car. And this is what it was like every time we walked by. Totally packed all the time. Everyone gawking at this car that you're never going to be able to buy. I don't want to waste your time with this. You can go on The Verge and read all about it because they got the private showing. I'm not bitter about it. It's what they do. It's the big institution that gets a lot of viewership. So of course they're going to give some opportunities to those larger media outlets to do that. Uh, I'm going to focus my time on things that those guys aren't covering. And it looks like that strategy has worked very well. The challenge though is that we're finding far less of that good stuff. And that's what made this show really frustrating uh, because typically I could run around the show floor for a little while and find a bunch of things to tell you about. This time it was very different. There just wasn't a lot of that new interesting stuff to add to the dispatch videos this go around. So as a small operation that covers a lot of different types of things, it's a very challenging effort to cover this show because the entire show to some degree is relevant to what I cover. Uh, so if I was just covering drones, for example, I could go to this one spot in one portion of the convention hall and I could spend all four days there. I'd have a blast doing that. Uh, but I have to go everywhere to try to find a few things that everyone else isn't finding. And that's what gets kind of challenging for me. And you're often balancing too getting that coverage versus shooting and editing and publishing because I do uh, some of the editing, Jake does a lot of it, but the publishing, I like to really look at it first before it goes up. I need to 
make tweak a few things here or there. At the end of the day, it's my voice. I want to make sure that I'm okay with what I'm putting out there. Uh, and so it takes a while to get the video up, let alone shoot it. Uh, and you have to find time to do both. And that's really a challenging uh, tug of war throughout the day to figure out, do I have enough here where I can stop and get the footage ready for edit? Or do I need to go out and find some more? And if I don't go out and find some more, what am I missing? You know, that kind of stuff is always in the back of your head there. Uh, the other challenge is that we're often um, going and looking for stuff all day long. Uh, so we might have events in the evening after the show floor closes. So those are the kinds of uh, time constraints and sleep constraints, perhaps, that you might uh, find yourself under. And the show really is enormous. Now, this is the map of the entire show, and it looks like it's pretty manageable here, but these are huge buildings in each of these big circles. Uh, so this is the main convention center area. And just to give you an idea, you can often see probably two or three major trade shows happening at the same time at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Uh, CES takes up the entire thing on its own. Uh, and then you've got a whole other huge convention center across the street uh, with the Sands Expo. That is completely filled. And then at the hotels nearby, uh, they've got all these private suites where a lot of companies prefer to exhibit themselves privately. Um, so that's a whole other factor to it. And it takes forever to get from one place to the other. And then, of course, you've got more stuff happening over on some of these other hotels on the Strip. So it's really hard to go and decide, OK, I'm going to go to all three of these main convention sites and get a bunch of appointments with folks, you're never gonna get it done. It's impossible to get around. Uh, you really have to budget your time appropriately because every minute of the, of the day when you're traveling and not covering something, you're not producing, and that, uh, again, adds some pressure. So that's why, if you're wondering what, why I didn't see Hyperkin, for example, or one of these other companies, it's because they weren't on the show floor and maybe at one of these private suites that I just couldn't get to and wasn't invited to, which makes it uh, really tough. Now, this is the basement of the Sands Expo Center. So when you get into one of these buildings, there's multiple levels typically. And this will take you all day, like eight hours to go through. Um, and this is where all the startups are. And usually, we'd go up and down these aisles and find something of interest in every aisle, at least, if not more. This year, it was not the case. There was just a lot of stuff that had zero interest with me and I think would have had zero interest with you as well. And we spent a lot of time, wasted a lot of time actually just walking around here and it just wasn't good use of my time this year to uh, go to this place. It's always been a really good place to go. So we're gonna be thinking about doing some things differently. Now, one thing that I always do though is go to the events that make the discovery process more efficient. And there are three events that I always try to get to. One is Pepcom's Digital Experience. That was in Dispatch 1. Uh, the second one is Showstoppers. That was in Dispatch 2. And there's CES Unveiled that happens the night before the show starts. All three of these events are great to go to because they take a bunch of these exhibitors and they put them in a single room right next to each other. So you go from one table to the next. It's almost like speed dating to some degree. Uh, and you can get a lot done in a very short span of time. The events that they have are typically about two or three hours long. Uh, they feed you there. They have free drinks. It's a great opportunity for the media to uh, connect with each other and with the brands directly. Uh, you often get access to people you won't get uh, during the show floor hours. And sometimes you don't see these companies on the show floor at all. So I know a lot of people who go just for these three events and then they go home. They don't even hit the show floor. Uh, so for the future, what am I going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is make more media appointments next year. I really need to plan better because I've just been getting lucky finding some great stuff to show you. Uh, not so lucky anymore. So we're going to really spend a lot more time looking at the inbound pitches from all the PR people. Uh, we're also going to uh, just try to reach out more to some companies that we know are interesting to the viewership so that we can set up those appointments and make better use of uh, my time and of the camera person's time. Because if we're just walking around and not finding anything, that is a lot of valuable time wasted. Uh, the other thing we're thinking about doing is maybe bringing a third person along next year. It will cost more but they can go out and scout ahead of time. And that would waste less time, of course, because once we have that scouting done, uh, we can do a bunch of appointments while the scout is scouting. And then we can run over to that particular location, jump to the booths that we know are gonna be good, and then move on to the next thing. So I think that's where a third person, even though it will add cost, 
uh, might really make a lot of sense and maybe it would make sense to collaborate with a few other channels to share that cost. So that's something I'm thinking about for the future. Now, as far as viewership is concerned, we're doing pretty well this year. Dispatch One is not doing as well as Dispatch One did last year, but uh, Dispatch Two and Three are doing better. So I think the package overall here is uh, an improvement over what we did last year with those three videos. So I'm pretty pleased with the audience response. It looks like the way we're doing the coverage is compatible with what the YouTube algorithm wants and uh, by extension, what the YouTube audience is looking for. It looks like a lot of you enjoyed the coverage as well. And it really is, of course, driven by the things that we find. Uh, so of course, we're going to be adjusting our strategy to find more stuff to fill these videos up with things that are more interesting. So uh, that is the goal for next year. We learned a lot as we always do at each of these shows. And my philosophy here is continuous improvement. We gotta keep looking Looking at ways to improve what the audience is looking for and hopefully ex extend the viewership as a result of that. And we'll be taking those lessons to heart for next year. And that will bring me to my Q&A for you this week. I want to hear from you as to what you thought of the coverage. Uh, obviously, the products are pretty good. I'd like to hear about that. I'd like to hear about things you would like to see done differently. Uh, let me know down in the comments section. So as I work on getting my health and sanity back from CES, I do have some things planned for you to watch here on the channel. Uh, the first is my interview with the CEO of Plex. We shot that while we were out at uh, CES at one of those suites, and it was a good interview actually, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. That's coming up a little later this week. Uh, we also uh, will have my video of me putting together this uh, portable Nintendo Switch dock. And what I like about this little Switch dock is that it uses the guts from the original uh, Nintendo Switch dock. You basically take apart your original dock and put the parts into this smaller one if you're looking for something portable. Uh, we did this as a live stream the other day, but this one will be a much more digestible uh, edited video that you can see to figure out if this is something you might want to use for your own Switch at home. So that's coming up and I'll probably have a few other things too depending on the energy level this week. Now if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We of course are also part of that new YouTube membership program so you can become a member just by clicking on the join button on my YouTube channel if that is more convenient for you. You'll get a cool badge that will appear next to your name in chat and in comments. It's pretty neat stuff. Uh, we also have our ongoing relationship with Plex. So if you sign up for a free Plex account to get all of their free services, uh, you can do that with the link you see on screen here. No credit card required and we get a small commission for that. We also get a commission if you sign up for a Plex pass or gift it to somebody else. We have a lot of channels that we put our stuff out on, including my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We'll have some more stuff going up there soon. We have my podcast, which is an audio version of this show. We have the Snippets channel for search-friendly portions of this show that are easier to find. We have the live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. And we have my newest thing, my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, where you can find my live streams that I do for Amazon. If you want to be notified when I go live, you can click on the bell here on YouTube. That will send you a notification every time I do anything that uh, the algorithm deems necessary for you to see. You can get it there. Uh, we also, of course, have ways to engage with me via my email list. It's very infrequent. Uh, we did send out an email when we dropped the first CES video, but that was it. Uh, we also have my Facebook page and the Facebook group, which is always growing. You can check that out at lon.tv slash Facebook group to connect with me and other viewers. It's a great source of uh, stuff for this show, so check that out. And then we have the store at lon.tv slash store where I sell things that I've previously reviewed here on the channel. And oftentimes they're brand new items that were used just enough to be reviewed. Uh, those are the things that I buy and later resell. Uh, you can get an email alert every time I add something to the store at lon.tv slash store alert. So that is going to do it though for this week's weekly wrap up, kind of a special edition to get my thoughts out uh, and start thinking about next year's uh, coverage already. And again, I really would value your feedback on the show and what you'd like to see next year. Uh, so let me know down in the comments section. We'll be compiling all of that and making some notes for future CES coverage. And that's going to do it for now. I'm going to go edit this and take an early night, I think. I'm still a little beat up from my trip home. So uh, stay tuned. Much more to come. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht,
Rajesh, Logic GR, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.